This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hey, welcome everyone to the uh, welcome everyone to the Clean Network Hall uh, today. Um, before we get started with our presentation, I'd like to ask if there are any announcements. Sure, Jim Callahan. Um, let's see, a nice Earth Day announcement um, here in San, in San Francisco. Um, the city of San Francisco is now going to have all commercial buildings needing to be 100% energy renewal. Of course, that's over a, a few years of, of implementing that, but that's a pretty big step forward. Um, to, to pull things like that off takes a lot of education at the professional level, um, the, the community level, the government level, and if, even K-12 schools are bringing kids up on things. Um, something I want to run by the team uh, uh, later, or community people later, is when people are at AGU, would they be interested in touring one of these schools? It's across the street from AGU, from where it is. Oh, it um, sounds like a great idea. Yeah, and uh, you know, a chance mm -hmm. to see that connect. Um, so you, think, just, you say all commercial buildings or all school buildings? All commercial buildings. Um, and it and to be what net zero or? What was it? Uh, it well, it's it's it, 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 there is the net zero. This this was functioning on that they have 100% renewable energy. Oh, 100%. Um, and and I guess well no. And part of it is if you go net zero, that's a that's a very quick way to get there, right? Yeah. If, if you're getting your energy from yourself, then that, or you know balancing mm -hmm. it. Um, but in any in any case, there's there's the there's the workforce development, there's the connecting to the professional level, and then the resources and the connections they have. I, I know that Clean is largely geared toward K-12 schools, um, mm -hmm. but it's a community, and there's there's a you know reaching outside that frame in turn helps what we do inside that frame. So yeah, thank you. I'll 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 look to first just to see if people are really want to do that, and then we can set set up a tour or one, one whatever, whatever that, format. One thing that you when you when you start to set it up, think about how many people can actually be accommodated, and whether we want to just keep that to members of the clean network to visit or open it up more broadly. Yes, just good, and good. I think it's just a matter of capacity that as to how right. we go there. Yeah, good advice on that. Good advice. I mean, certainly we want this to be a. a uh, we want our steps to have a positive mm -hmm. outcome, not just not just learning, but, but people who are going to actually yeah. work together to do things. But that you know, all commercial buildings covers a whole lot of business sectors. Yes, it seems and, to me, and that's really yeah. that's huge. So the the all of these business sectors have bought into that, or is this just a mandate from the government? Well, it it would not have happened if if uh, the commercial sector is is generally favorable to it. Right. I mean, if there was a lot of push, they would, it would have been hard for this to be implemented. So, yes, it is from the government, but it's it's a I mean, when, when you think about it, too, is when we're when we're San Francisco, it is largely a commercial city. It is not an industrial city anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's it's incredible if you name off the uh, the tech and the Internet companies that are based there from Twitter to LinkedIn to I mean, kind of just name most of them. They're in San Francisco. And that's and it's their buildings that are going to be affected. So uh, mm -hmm. Google has a big presence there. It just kind of goes on and on. Of, of uh, look, look at the names. Is that such a wide? That's just a such a widespread effort that I think that you could actually engage students in all the schools in helping to move things in that direction. It's just a great educational opportunity. Right. Yes, absolutely, and I, that that's part of what I what I'm looking to do is, since I kind of bridge the K-12 world and the and the uh, professional development world, or the professional level world to try to have that bridge be be stronger. I, I don't think there's going to be anybody pushing against it. It's sort of, sort of making it happen. AGU just seems like a great example to um, not only help make that happen in the in the Bay Area, but 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 having models and best practices mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other Jim, announcements? Jim, is, Go ahead. Yeah, Jim, this is Frank. I just wanted to, uh, uh, you, your point about uh, the clean is really K-12. Um, I think over the last four or five years, we've been really moving beyond just, I mean, not abandoning, but expanding beyond just K-12. Um, the original collection was higher education and grade, grade six, but then also the informal place-based frontline communities, indigenous communities, informal education, community leader education. I think, you know, we're, we're truly trying to get a more comprehensive audience set. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, totally with you. Love the idea, but I think we're 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 looking at a much richer um, audience framework uh, these days. And and the last thing on that is that youth and workforce are the center of that audience model. So um, I think that that very much aligns with what you're talking about. Um, so that's cool. Great, and and certainly I have no problems with what you just said. That's that's um, very supportive of of exactly what you just said. And Perfect. I'll maybe just add to that, um, to, like on a related note about workforce development opportunities and um, building energy measures in California. There's a recent CEC um, grant that was awarded to do low income building retrofits to try and get at the energy emissions from existing buildings and not just new construction. And so there's a big effort right now in California to retrofit low income multifamily residential housing to be as energy efficient as possible um, as sort of both an energy efficiency and social justice measure to reduce energy costs for those residents. Um, so there's like yeah, a multi-million dollar grant that was just awarded to the Rocky Mountain Institute to do this work in California and then ideally scale it nationwide. So I think <clears throat> there's like currently not right now a lot of people that know how to affordably and efficiently retrofit existing buildings but that's like something they're very much looking to fund and develop for so for all of us who work with youth kind of messaging this opportunity i think is really important to kind of build hope and momentum around um green energy careers of the future <laughs> would would uh, a conversation with them about uh you know career and technical education high school you know work and community college uh, program development in that area uh, be part of that focus, do you think? I do think so. And I know, so um, I know someone cl who's working closely with Rocky Mountain Institute on developing the RFP to get like basically applications for how to do this. And so I think that could go out to community college and technical institutions that do construction related work. Um, they're basically looking to put on building jackets around these buildings that are basically extra layers of insulation rather than tear down and replace the whole building itself. Just kind of add a layer of insulation, I guess, is the, the main idea, but keep, you know, the building in place and not have to displace residents. So it's a really exciting project. And I think it would be something that could generate a lot of like competitions or momentum among community colleges and technical um, institutions. So yeah, I will definitely pass on the RFP to you, maybe Frank, or the clean community and see if people want to circulate it. That'd be great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Any other announcements? Well, did anybody talk about the uh, the 1A news program earlier today on NPR? No, go ahead, Frank. Yeah. So uh, I just caught it midstream. Uh, I sent a note out to the Clean Network uh, while it was happening, but Leah Kuzbuff, who's the Deputy Director for the Alliance for Climate Education, and Ann Reed from the National Center for Science and Education, um, were both on with these two other people for an hour-long conversation about teaching climate change um, on NPR nationwide, which was, uh, I've never seen that before, so that was cool. Um, and imagine it it's now a podcast. Oh, I'm sure. It, you know, all of this stuff is recorded and multi-purposed and tweeted. And you know, I sent the link to the announcement for it, but I'm, su I'm assuming that the podcast is there. Um, and uh, you know, it was, it was the beginning of a conversation. So um, I would encourage those who are interested in listening in a recorded fashion or who are multitasking as we speak. <laughs> To, uh, to check it out. Okay, thanks. Any other um, announcements? Okay, if not, we will uh, start with our speaker today. Alana Signer is um, going to be talking to us about food and climate curriculum that she's developed. Uh, Alana is, um, has an undergraduate degree with a double major in environmental studies and international relations. Um, and while she was doing her undergraduate work at Tufts University, she was the local outreach chair for Tufts Engineering Without Borders chapter and spent three summers traveling in Uganda to work with a, a um, water, clean water storage project. 
Um, she served for two years in AmeriCorps um, as a national teaching fellow with citizen schools, working with eighth graders in the Boston Public Schools, and is currently a PhD candidate in Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley, where she researches sustainability, agroecological -eco food systems, and farm to school programs as mechanisms for developing student environmental and climate literacy. And so with that, Alana, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Tamara. Um, yes, so I am Elena or Lainey Signer, um, and I'm getting my PhD here at UC Berkeley in the Energy and Resources Group. Um, and I apologize in advance, I'm also recovering from a bit of a spring cold, and so hopefully I won't have any coughing issues, but if I do, just bear with me, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, as part of my PhD, I've been developing a food systems and climate change curriculum for school gardens and farm-based education programs that I would like to share with you all today. Um, and I've submitted this curriculum to the Clean Collection, where it's gone through a series of revisions and um, editing processes with the managers of the Clean Collection, as well as some teachers um, that I'm including my mom. Um, so we'll hopefully be available and more accessible on that platform really soon. Um, and in addition to my work on food systems and climate education, I've also worked with members of the clean community to develop and evaluate the Lowell School Climate Change Curriculum, which is a year-long focus of the sixth grade um, through a humanities lens. And excitingly, that work um, that we've evaluated from the first year curriculum pilot is going to be published soon in um, environmental education research. So I'll be sure to send out that paper when it is released to the CLEAN network. Um, Okay, so let's see if I advance. Oh, that, okay, great. So first of all, I'd like to share some of my personal motivation for approaching climate change education through food. Um, I study food systems at UC Berkeley and have been made increasingly aware of the impact our global food system has on the climate, but also more promisingly, the impact that the food system could have in helping to mitigate climate change. So currently, agriculture accounts for between 14 and 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions if you account for land use change. But farming activities are also possibly the largest and cheapest form of carbon sequestration that currently exists. Um, and restoring carbon that has been released from agricultural soils through tillage and fertilizer application and managing soils organically to replace chemical fertilizers, which lead to large N2O emissions, both have enormous potential to reduce greenhouse gas concentrations if practiced at scale on farms around the world. In fact, eight of the top uh, 20 solutions listed on the Project Drawdown website are food sector solutions. And not only is the greenhouse gas benefit a compelling piece of a switch to more organic regenerative food systems, uh, but this sort of transformation also would have really positive human health and farmer economic implications as diversified food systems would provide more nutritious food products to consumers and farmers would stand to benefit from diversifying their production systems while reducing purchased inputs in ways that might start to make farming a financially viable lifestyle again, which it currently is not in many cases. Um, so I've come to believe that food represents a feel-good, approachable way to engage in climate solutions and a relevant, close-to-home way to frame the problem. After all, we all eat three meals a day, usually. <laughs> There, and there's growing consensus among medical and public health professionals that the best diet for planetary health is also the best diet for human health. Um, there's also proliferating efforts to address climate change through food systems, notably from groups like Kiss the Ground and Patagonia and the Zero Food Print Project and other regenerative ag and agroecology organizations that promote production and consumption strategies um, for storing carbon back in the soil and growing healthy food. And I should add that there are also important social justice implications and motivation behind a lot of these organizations as well, focused on improving, improving rural farming livelihoods and farm worker rights. Um, so it becomes more like a win-win, win-win <laughs> um, through food systems transformations. So, okay, great, next slide. So here's the list of the top 20 project drawdown solutions. And you can see food-related examples include reducing food waste, um, eating a plant-rich diet, adopting practices like silvopasture and agroforestry, 
um, some of which are maybe really accessible to a school garden or a school farm teacher, like reducing waste and eating a plant-rich diet. Um, unless you have a pretty big school, you might not be able to put in some agroforestry or silvo pasture systems, but in rural areas, maybe. Um, and then this book, Pharmacology, that recently came out is a great example of exploring the linkages between a healthy soil microbiome and a healthy human gut microbiome. And in it, Miller advocates for things like prescription vegetable CSA shares for patients struggling with a variety of diet-related diseases. So here again, sort of the human ecological climate health um, network is kind of very intertwined. And I think that can provide strong motivation for students that are probably familiar with a lot of the growing diet-related disease epidemics um, and also the, the climate, climate crisis we are in. Um, so yeah, so following from these trends in food and ag science, there's growing interest among school garden teachers and farm-based educators in incorporating a climate education element into what they do with food and farming and students. And I, I first identified this interest as an outgrowth of my master's project in the San Juan Islands in Washington state, and then found further interest among school garden teachers in California, as well as farm-based educators in Vermont and Maine. Um, so being a former middle school teacher before graduate school, I began to develop a food and climate change curriculum module in consultation with some of these garden and farm educators. Um, so I will show you what that has started to look like. So I've now posted my curriculum on my personal website so that I can share it more easily with interested parties while continuing to update it when new ideas come in. And I have pages on the website for schools interested in adapting the curriculum, as well as farms, um, which is meant to be more flexible to potentially outdoor as well as indoor uh, learning environments and outdoor classrooms. Um, so making the website is the main progress I've made towards sharing the curriculum easily. Since I last presented on a clean teleconference last winter about similar, similar themes. Um, so I'm hoping, yeah, that right now it's housed here and uh, might live in a more permanent place that's not tied to my personal website in the future. Um, but right now this is a good way for me to keep updating it and keep sharing the link around, mostly just with people who ask me for it or who I connect with at, um, sorry, <laughs> at conferences and um, other climate education um, networking spaces. So let's see. And so I've labeled it as mostly geared towards students in grades six to 12, um, because I do think that most of the themes expressed are kind of building on an elementary level of um, earth science and uh, topics that require a little bit more agency than younger students may have, like choosing what you eat and choosing transportation options to get to and from school or work. So um, it is a little bit more focused on higher grade levels um, right now. So this slide gives an overview of the six main lessons or sections of the curriculum with a guiding question, topic, and experiential learning activity for each section. Um, so for example, in lesson two, when students explore what factors, including agriculture, have caused the rise in global temperature, they study the causes of climate change and the carbon cycle, and then participate in a role-playing activity where they act out the flows of carbon between the soil, the atmosphere, the ocean, and the trees. Um, and this activity was thought up by a UC Davis law school student, I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't, um, <laughs> who is the former director of the Community Alliance for Agroecology based in California's San Joaquin Valley. And the role-playing activity is actually a really cool way of starting to kind of visualize carbon flows, which is it can be a really abstract concept for students. And the, it, going along with the visualization of carbon um, Jim, your mobile climate science lab, which I know Lowell has started using, has been a great way for students to interact with a CO2 molecule, which I think also could fit really nicely into this lesson where students have kind of a large ball in the center representing the carbon um, and then two like tennis balls on flimsy, um, I guess pieces of, I don't know, it's like saw blades that kind of bounce and show how the CO2 molecule is able to trap and, and um, reflect outgoing, um, outgoing radiation and kind of trap that warmth. 
So I think just basically the idea of making the carbon cycle and carbon flows more visible to students is the idea in lesson two. And then you start to talk about like where carbon is coming from and going to and how you can make it go where you want when we move into the climate action and solutions lessons um, further on in lessons five and six. So let's see. So where I have implemented the curriculum so far has been at several schools in Oakland, um, as well as on Lopez Island, Washington. And I've been refining the curriculum each time that I teach it. Um, my goal is for it to be a living document that evolves and changes at each site as needed. And so I've learned a few things from the initial implementations, like what students are most interested in, what teachers might want or might most struggle with. Um, and in a lot of these cases, I've been co-teaching the six lessons or so with the school garden teachers. Um, but in an effort to try and move beyond that, um, I wanna try and make as many um, lesson prep resources available on my website as well so that teachers can ideally teach it more independently and. Um, and this kind of also speaks to a need for more professional development opportunities to really empower teachers with the language and the vocabulary and the foundational steps um, in, a, in any curriculum like this so that they can confidently go off and teach it and inspire students. Um, but yeah, like I have heard from students very memorably that they remember things like um, the methane emissions from farting animals that really sticks with them <laughs> and the kind of begs the conversation about meat consumption and potentially reducing our meat consumption to have less animals farting and producing methane. Um, other really memorable activities have been around compost pile creation and just considering compost like a living carbon pool that then goes into the soil and brings more carbon into the soil with it. Um, students love compost. I don't know, they, they like watching food rot. <laughs> so there's been some really, really great takeaways from there. Um, what has been a challenge, I would say, is holding students' attention in more of like an indoor classroom component before going out to work in a school garden or farm. Um, there's often just this mad rush to get out into the garden and not a lot of focusing or paying attention. And, and school garden classes in particular, I think, sort of struggle with being a time when students aren't as focused and aren't as um, academically geared. So having them do things like take notes or listen to a, even a 10 minute presentation about a topic can be a challenge, um, which I'm still trying to work through and kind of minimize and try and have some of the learning take place more organically through conversations in the garden. But again, holding student attention has been um, a challenge I'm working on addressing. Um, and in more farm-based education settings, um, I am excited to be working with the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps and Shelburne Farms and the Wolf's Neck Center in Maine this summer to do a little bit of educator training and professional development with them um, geared towards educating their instructors or um, teachers that come to their centers um, in, so that they can incorporate food systems and climate into their existing practices and offerings. So my partnerships will be a little different in each place, but I'm excited that there was strong interest in all these places to do something with climate change and farming. Um, and one in Wolf's Neck is more of a culinary summer camp for teens that they're hoping to incorporate some climate info into why we should eat more of a plant-based diet, for example. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna pause there. Um, I have some backup slides on student results um, from the curriculum, but I wanna just pause and take some questions um, or ask for, clear if anyone wants to ask for clarification or elaboration on things you're interested in, I'd love to hear what those things are. And so, yeah, I'm just gonna pause now and see what folks most wanna so dive Lindy, in. So Lindy, this is, this is Tamara, I do have a, a question. Um, you uh -huh. mentioned that you've had the, you've adapted it to the various contexts that you've implemented it in. And I was wondering, do you have a, start here template and then uh, work to adapt it to the particular locations or is it a yeah, little so, bit more adaptable beforehand? Or how, yeah, do you, so, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. great question. Um, so I, what I've done so far is mostly um, co communicate with organizations directly who are interested in using it and ask them 
where they're at or what they want to use it for. And so I might tell them, you know, jump right into the last two lessons where you do climate solutions on the farm or the garden. If your students kind of already know what climate change is and why it's a problem. Um, or if they're just wanting to start from scratch and incorporate student learning around climate change and they've never done that before, I might say like, here's the six lessons. Basically it moves through what is climate change? What are the causes? What are the effects? How do we know it's happening? And then what can you do about it? Um, which is really a framework that I uh, learned from climate generation in their next generation climate curriculum modules. So, so that structure is kind of the bare bones structure where I'll say, here's the structure. You don't have to do every lesson or every activity, but you should basically keep the order intact because it does make a lot of logical sense. Um, so it's mostly like, yeah, if you've already talked about climate change, maybe jump into the end and have students choose an activity that they would be most excited to implement in the garden or farm. And you can provide them a few examples, which those activities do um, in the lesson plans, and then let them kind of lead their own experiential moment in the garden uh, related to climate change. So that's kind of how I've adapted it so far. And have you had other people using it or you are the one that's teaching them all? Um, so I've been the one mostly communicating about it. And let's see, I shared it at a California Science Teachers Association conference in California um, two falls ago, I think. And so some of those teachers like then went off to use it. They had the like printouts of the lesson plans and I've been kind of in touch with those people. So really, I think it's all flowed through me so far, but <laughs> ideally that will not be the case. And and I've sort of lost track of some of the people in California who said they were using it two years ago and and sort of how that went because not everyone responds to their emails, um, especially busy teachers. So yeah, it's been centralized through me and we'll see how that goes in the future. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, Lainey, this is uh, Frank over at NOAA. Um, a, uh, a kind of a higher level question for you. Um, uh -huh. When we talk about curriculum, um, sometimes like in clean, we have a bunch of educational resources, but we're starting uh -huh. to look at kind of like more program level initiatives. And it feels like what you're doing is, and I'm just looking for clarification and maybe it helps you with the way you describe it, um, yeah. is that, that, you know, where you have schools that have farms, or in school farms or or educational institutions who are new farming as part of their learning with students um, uh -huh. this is like a supplementary curriculum for those types of places like you wouldn't i would imagine this wouldn't work for any educational setting these are really you know in the context of farming uh mm -hmm. you know where they're pro you know does that make sense Yes, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. And so, and it is, I have been grappling with the fact that curriculum might not be the right word. And so I've, I've tried to put together basically a series of lesson plans with like lesson materials and teacher preparation for each of the six guiding questions. And so I've done that, but I'm not sure that that's actually the most useful outcome from this. And it might really be that it's right. a programmatic tool or lens that people can adopt. And it's more like, I teach the program about it and they implement it however they want. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't actually know like where it's going to go from here, but that's a good point of right. clarification. I should maybe change how I'm framing it. Um, well, because it, 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 it feels like to me, what it feels like to me that you're describing is a really important uh, piece, but you're supplementing an existing program to focus mm -hmm. on, you know, food and climate. So that, yeah, you know, exactly. you've got to have this thing and then you're adding this additional frame because of the importance of that connection, something like that. Exactly. I don't know, that, that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. And I think I should start adopting this more like it's a supplemental frame type of language because it's like the work that these school gardens and farms are already doing is already valuable and it's already having an impact on students just to see plants grow and know where their food comes from and all these kind of more basic principles of school gardening and food literacy. But I think it's just extra, extremely important to add climate change to that conversation because it's already a great learning opportunity for students where they're engaged. And it just it's kind of like, yeah, like you're saying, a supplemental frame or a, an added layer of opportunity to conduct meaningful climate education in, a, in an educational context. Um, 
Exactly. So, yeah. And so I have, I mean, I have been really surprised by how much the, how strong the interest has been. Not that I've workshopped this with hundreds of people or anything, but uh, the people that I have talked to have been really enthusiastic. And so it's making me think like, huh, this, this might not be happening to a great degree yet, or school gardens don't really often have structured curriculum. So anything that they can add to the already, like let's go out and dig and weed and apply compost in the garden kind of framework is, is interesting um, to a lot of those teachers. So yeah, it's been, it's been a learning journey for me and I hope to keep it going this summer in some of these less school-like and more farm-like settings. <laughs> So just the last point, when you, yeah. uh, sorry, I'll be quick. Uh, when you feel like you've got it tight like that, um, uh, there are other networks where you have schools and gardens, uh, whether it's National Wildlife Federation, the new, uh, way it's the Nurture Nature Network or the, you know, that we're doing this uh, kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, to help disseminate, we can talk later. Okay, cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you it's so much. I mean, I'll, I'll know a lot more, I think, after the summer about how to layer it onto already existing and successful programs. So I'll maybe I'll reach out then. Yeah, perfect. Lainey, Jim Callahan, um, thank you. Um, when, one is, I, I, I see an element of what you're doing, which is something I'm encouraging, I would like to encourage others to consider is one of the ways we go about things. We can develop curriculum as in we're developing something that then the K-12 teachers themselves are going to make available to the students. Uh -huh. there, is, there is also the approach, which I think is an element of what you're doing, which you have climate education specialists, people who really know this stuff and can make it exciting and have all the pieces together, and then you're going into the schools. Uh -huh. uh, I have found that that greatly resonates. It's, uh, teachers yeah. don't see that as a threat. They love it. They love the help. They love it exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I would think that you're looking at far more schools than you'll ever have time to reach, right? I mean, that's the way I, I think you'd be heading of people will really want you, what, excuse me, want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, toward that is, is one of, I mean, that, that then can then help develop programs and techniques and you can have videos and ways that other t that regular k-12 teachers can do it or other parts of the country where mm -hmm. specialists can do this i think mm -hmm. another point would be uh, people can feel overwhelmed if there's so many solutions there's so many things to deal with but isn't so much of education we know that at, at uh at the undergraduate level that specializing within climate education whether it be food or energy or however what kind of solution we take on mm -hmm. to get into a particular area and implement that and be a specialist I'm talking to the students themselves mm -hmm. is often more valuable to have one or two areas where you you've really drilled down into it and you're into it and it's exciting to you and you're part of it than yeah. 20 where you only have five minutes on each one and you just talk about it and you never do anything Right. I yeah. Mean, yeah. yeah exactly. I don't think we should feel, oh, now we have to do food, too. Well, some of us. Yeah, let's do food. Yeah. Um, the part I want to do with that is especially because we're all here in the Bay Area or California. Please, I'd be glad to have conversations. And there's so many things that I saw in your material before uh, the started um, things that you were bringing up of if there's connections that we can share with you on. Um, and things I think you're probably already doing. But I mean, there is there is uh, the thing of. So what are the farms in California? that mm -hmm. you know, real working food farms, right? The, mm -hmm. the local CSAs, I think the local CSAs, I know some in particular, would love to have <coughs> some connection with you, right? They already, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our local CSA um, has a couple events a year where they want all the families to come up, right? I mean, so they have educational events mm -hmm. um, at the farm. Um, oh, yeah. And of course, we have the wonderful uh, farmer's market. I can speak to whenever I vote, spoke to a farmer's market about us bringing our climate demonstrations and things there they would love to have that i mean having mm -hmm. educational material at them in fact it's just more like we have to kind of put it down on our priority list the f farmers market's great but we've got these huge events right um but i mean if that helps and of course there's the city oakland berkeley um anyway i mean the, I, I guess one thing i was seeing in in the, the very uh uh large scale views you had on, on where you could go on things is i was thinking Okay, when you have a CS, you're thinking of a CSA and things about uh, community-supported agriculture. Excuse me, that um, 
uh, working with existing ones, so you don't have to feel you have to start one. Is that mm -hmm. is that part of it? Um, yeah. Yeah. And then lastly, also, Lainey, uh, if you like some of the demonstrations we have or Lowell has, I will give them to you. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, you know, okay. So we'll, we'll get you what you want to use. All right. Okay. That, I would love no to problem. have a CO2 molecule. Yeah. I no, love no, that. Yeah, we, we will get them to you as soon as you need them. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Jim. Those are all really good points and suggestions. And on the note about co-teaching, I do really agree, and this speaks to maybe some of the research highlights that I could share from Oakland um, implementations is, you know, one of my co-teachers said, one thing I like about having co-teachers is that it just makes, um, it just means more to students. They listen better, and I learn from the experience, and I can begin to weave it into what I do and teach. And so exactly like you're saying, like, teachers aren't threatened by that, and, and it's almost just a huge relief to not have to take on this extra layer of knowledge development and teaching on a subject that might be new to some teachers. But I think it's really would be valuable to have more of a, I don't know, education career sector that's like climate education specialists or to somehow motivate more grad students to go into their local schools in their community mm -hmm. and help out and teach a little bit. Because, I mean, that's something that, yeah, I've kind of recognized by doing this. Like I can't get to very many schools myself, but, but I think, the co-teaching model is a potentially good one to not have it all be on teachers getting themselves to professional development opportunities or like learning a whole curriculum module before teaching it. So, cause yeah, a lot of these people who study the issue of climate change related to food or water or energy are passionate and fired up about it. And they can really easily translate that excitement to students, I think. Um, so yeah, so whether it's in the classroom or at a local CSA or a farmer's market, I think, those are all great opportunities to just be messaging to people who are already thinking about food, like what are the food solutions for engaging in climate change? And if you wanna, if you're already on the food path, like how can you do that? And you don't have to obviously take on all the energy solutions and water solutions too, but yeah, it's like, where can we all engage and plug into the solution um, if we want to, but we just are often not sure how to start. Um, so yeah, I appreciate a lot of those suggestions and We'll have to connect in the Bay Area to get the some of those materials that I can use when I do go in and teach in places. Um, yeah, because that would be great. <laughs> and Lainey, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to monopolize or anything here, but I, I also should also offer, if you're looking to do outreach, if you want uh -huh. what you're doing to be known around the Bay Area, please, we'd be glad to help too. You know, we're okay. we're 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 with the Girl Scouts with seven thousand this weekend, and we're at the Vermont Youth Forum. They, oh. We can get you into all these places. I mean, you, okay, you're, great. You, we we can adapt it so you have a place. Uh, we'll help draw the crowd, and then we'll have the teachers and the kids and everybody who's there come over and see what you're doing. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I've been focusing a lot on the sort of more academic -y sides of this right now because I'm trying to finish up my PhD, but. I do think there's an important outreach component that I would like to engage with more. So it's good to know that maybe I could partner with you on that. <laughs> sure. No problem. Yeah. Hey, other questions? Hey, Lainey, this is uh, Patrick. Thank you for your presentation. Sure, yeah. Um, so hearing you talk through this, it sounds like you've done quite a bit of, of piloting, um, but I was wondering, uh, have you piloted in both formal and informal context, which it sounds like you have, but if so, maybe it would be helpful to um, add in some of those lessons learned from the piloting on the website, or add the teachers that you piloted with as resources for those looking to teach it and talk through it with their, their co-educators. Yeah, that's a really good point, Patrick. And and so I, I should clarify, thus far, I've mostly piloted it in school garden classrooms, so more the formal education environment. And this summer, I'll be piloting it with more informal um, settings, like summer camps on farms, like that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, but I do think having teachers that have done it before or like farms that have hosted the curriculum themes listed on the website as resources and little short of sort of short quotes or testimonials would be a great idea. And I am now very excited to add that on there when I when I get a chance. I could start with the teachers that I've interviewed from Oakland and Lopez and then add on a little bit more from the summer work. Um, 
but yeah, I think that would be great. And then asking teachers, of course, if they'd be willing to be listen, like their names just be up there to be a reference, I think would be um, really valuable for people that are considering using it. So I appreciate that suggestion. <laughs> Other questions or comments? If so there aren't I, any other questions, oh yeah, go ahead, Tamara. I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask, um, so that you, 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 as it was just mentioned, it sounds like this has been more in a pilot phase. Do you have a vision of how this might scale? Um, so I, I do have a vision. I don't know how far fetched it is, but. I've been sort of interested in um, kind of putting the curriculum out there in, in two platforms that do reach a lot of schools and farms, one being the National Farm to School Program and potentially list, like finding a way to reach out to them and have this re curriculum resource listed on their website when they list school garden resources. Um, because there's you know over 40,000 school gardens across the country that are part of the National Farm to School Network. Um, I do think most of those are elementary school gardens and this and there's fewer middle and high school gardens um, participating but I think this could be disseminated that way um, and I think through the farm-based education network that Shelburne Farms hosts which is a network of farms all uh, I think it's mostly in New England yeah a network of New England farms. So say that again it's the farm-based what? Farm-based education network oh, F-B-E-N. Yeah, so they have a monthly newsletter that goes out and a website of resources. So I think also maybe after working with Shelburne this summer, finding a way to put that out on the farm-based education network to reach farms would be two ways I could see mm -hmm. this scaling up. Um, but I'm also open to suggestions. I don't, I haven't thought about others yet. Well, I, I can talk to you offline, but I have a vision for ongoing professional development in which teachers work together and, and support each other along with these external expertise that um, might be useful in terms of moving forward and being local focus some of those uh -huh. focus some of the local focus could be around these uh, these uh, farms um, and so mm -hmm. we can talk about that offline but I just wanted to yeah. put that out as, a, as, a, as another mechanism to potentially get it more used but right now this is just an envisioned program it's not actual implemented yet yeah, Working great. On that. That's cool. Yeah, I would love to chat more about that with you. Um, cool. Any other questions, comments? Sure. La uh, Lainey, another one, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. It, when when uh, in scaling up, then of course there's a the question of funding. Um, what would be the likely institution or nonprofit that who would be the principal the principal of your of funding that you're seeing would it be cal um i mean i can i can think of nonprofits that that are exist that may wouldn't mind being a fiscal sponsor as you're getting up and things like that but mm -hmm. you, i mean perhaps do you have ideas on or is that something is that something uh, a, a soon step or is that a little further down the line to looking for larger yeah. grant funding and things yeah that's a great question actually it's really pushing me to think about how i want to develop this further and especially kind of in relation to wrapping up my PhD at the end of the year um, in December, like whether Cal would want to be a fiscal sponsor or associated with this curriculum. I know Stanford has a more developed high school climate change education curriculum and a curriculum that they use at the Stanford farm. I don't know if that would be like, you know, Cal now wants to do that too, to be like on the cutting edge with them. but. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if Cal is necessarily the best place because I don't want, I mean, I think having an academic affiliation can be strong in many ways, but I don't want it to kind of be seen as like purely academic. I want it to be seen like maybe affiliating with a more well-known um, farm or food-based nonprofit would be a bit stronger. Um, I can think of a few examples in the Berkeley area, but I'd want to think more about the right kind of place for it. And yeah, and I'd welcome a conversation with you about that if you have thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. <laughs> one, one, one thing to think about. I mean, you've talked about teachers pretty much implementing this with suggestions from you, but uh -huh. if there's a way to integrate it, and this is another part of the model that I, I've envisioned, is uh -huh. um, to be part of a professional development program 
yeah. that I, I want another piece that I'm going to be pursuing is how um, how teachers access professional development dollars um, uh -huh. and, and how you can use that to not only support the professional development, but maintaining the resources because you will find yeah. that as your resources become older, they need to be updated. Yep. Um, just based, I mean, for two reasons. One is the science might change or the, the solutions might be um, enhanced due to new technology. Yeah. But also if you're start, if, if your materials refer to things that are old, it will begin to f seem old and less interesting to this. Yeah. Student. So that it, you do, exactly. you do just need to refresh them on some kind of ongoing basis. So finding this is another piece that I'm trying to pursue is what kinds of funding models um, might be possible. And yeah. uh, an academic home is a is a good is a good place for one reason that I've really discovered for professional development. If teachers are Using this as a, a professional development that might um, this might be able to contribute to, then um, if it's a university affiliation, there's there's less of a problem of getting whatever professional development credits from a university versus, ah. and it doesn't necessarily mean credits. It could be just documenting hours of professional development. I know that for sure. I know in Massachusetts that. Um, or organizations that provide professional development need to be vetted in some way. Um, now, whether or not they're vetted and they still get professional development points is still a muddy question. But to be mm -hmm. vetted, um, an organization that's not a university has to fill out this form, um, which really, when you go through the questions, really means that um, you have a long track record of providing professional development. So it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Uh, to be vetted to give professional development, you have to show you've been doing, giving professional development. Um, but universities only have to register, at least in Massachusetts. They don't have to pass through any other hoops. They just have to say they are providing professional development. And then they can document a teacher's done 40 hours or 20 hours oh, yeah. or whatever it is. Uh, um, but that kind of affiliation is worthwhile if, if you can get it even if it's, and I believe there should be multiple lines of revenue, and if the, the university wants to be a fiscal sponsor, that's fantastic. Uh -huh. uh, by thinking about other potential avenues too, and I, I'll probably at some point give another talk on the, a, clean, a talk on the clean network about some of this work I'm doing in terms of exploring financial models that might make these things more viable longer term. <laughs> Yeah, that would be, I would love to listen to more about that because, yeah, that's a good point about the advantages of um, hosting it within an academic space and having it be more accessible as a professional development tool that way. And, yeah, and I think until more states have, you know, legislation like Washington that pays teachers to go to professional developments on this topic, um, it will be, yeah, it'll be important to make it like as legitimate as possible and as mm -hmm. easily updated as possible. And yeah, that updating thing is key because I, I feel like right now when it's kind of more in my wheelhouse and focus, the curriculum at least, like whenever I hear of a new innovation in the food and ag space that's climate relevant or like new research about biochar being an effective tool to promote carbon sequestration, I just add it right in there. But if that's not constantly happening, you know, it, yeah, it does start to wear out and you need mm -hmm. you need to like reinvigorate it so i would say right now yeah. it might be at its peak i'm like constantly yes. updating it but that will not always be the case so having yes, a long-term yes. plan is good yeah 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 no that's a good point point. Um, and Lainey, um the uh, another another area on finance and this also may have uh, this also can be a thing for frank too on the larger question of finances um uh -huh. that um one of the interesting things in california is with cap and trade funding and where it's directed to go mm -hmm. um, an interesting one so there's cal fire that deals with the major fires but also is in charge of a lot of the grants to use cap and trade funding they have more mm -hmm. they they tell me they have more money than they know what to deal with they're trying to find where to send millions and millions of dollars the problem is that a, there's not a lot of legitimate programs that are doing what needs to be done um, and where it would come in is if there's an element of your work which has which can get into more orchards, orchards, or where it's trees involved, uh -huh. Uh -huh. then uh -huh. that could then open up that kind of money to you. 
right? Oh, that yeah. uh, it could be in the school, it could be in the urban environment, like in the school, in the urban schools. It could be in the uh -huh. farms, but getting trees in the ground to yeah. you know, and, and, or, and protecting trees. Um, yeah. That's a lot. That's an example where there is a substantial amount of money, um, but there needs to be programs that actually will do it that aren't aren't just trying to get the money and then have no intention of actually protecting. Oh or, yeah, or fascinating. Trees. Yeah, no, that's a big. That's been a big popular one as, when it comes to lessons five and six about students picking climate action projects they want to do in the garden. A lot of students want to plant trees and they want to plant like delicious fruit trees and have all the fruits and then they don't really realize that it takes maybe three years or so to get the, the fruit <laughs> of their labor to come into into fruition but um yeah no they that's that, they'd be great if there was money available for that from cap and trade funds in california because i think a lot of schools are trying to do that for so many reasons whether it's you know creating shade on the otherwise in, like really really hot blacktops and reducing the heat island effects and like there's, I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of tree planting activity I feel like going on in Oakland um, around school gardens. So yeah, that's that's a good funding thing, funding mechanism to look out for, um, which I'll definitely have to pass along. Um, yeah, well, let's see. I mean, I'll maybe just mention one quick thing before um, I finish up here, which is that one of the ways I've just been tracking the results of this curriculum, I mean, I haven't, I did this in the Oakland schools, I haven't been able to do this everywhere, is just giving students a pre-survey and a post-survey that's um, sort of a climate literacy measurement tool and just tracking how they do before and after and on which questions they score best on. So this was the, just the average from all schools in Oakland um, from, I think it was 2017 or 2018 that I did this, this particular round of surveying. Um, and just showing the increase in mean and uh, the number of students that were surveyed. And yeah, it's just, I mean, it might not always be possible everywhere, especially on a more farm based um, setting, but just surveying and measuring the impact on their knowledge about climate change. And then I also asked a set of questions about student engagement, um, like whether addressing and acting on climate change is a priority for them in life, whether they believe that what they do personally matters when it comes to mitigating climate change and the number of environmental activities that they participate in. So um, just seeing like really pretty small incremental changes so far in Oakland, but um, ideally finding ways to make that a meaningful contribution of the, of the curriculum. So that is also a work in progress. So yeah, I'll Great. stop there. And if there's no more questions, I'm happy to follow up with anyone offline as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I don't know if your those pre and post tests that, that you gave were those tests that you developed yourself, or are they vetted um, vetted yeah. uh, questions, or how? Did, yeah, how they did were that modified um, from a climate literacy survey, and I just modified. It was an adult survey, and I forget. No, oh God, what was the origin of it? Um, ah. I might, I might have to circle back with you on the original okay. source of the climate literacy survey, but I just modified it. It was for adults and I modified it to be more kid friendly language and That's made the, some of the questions a little shorter um, and kind of picked and choose. I think there was 15 questions in the original survey I was looking at and I chose 10 or 11 and added one that was kind of more basic than what the survey was getting at, but just asking students to differentiate between climate change and global warming. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, just seeing where they landed at the end of the six lessons was something I was curious about when I was, yeah, mostly when I was writing a research paper about the curriculum pilot. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead, Frank. Just one, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, I'm on the Metro now, but um, <laughs> the, the, last, the last part of this is that the, you know, if you go back to drawdown and the the piece of the work to quantify the carbon uh, reduction from the atmosphere of, of farming. Um, is that uh, prioritized and then are there techniques for if, if it's school farms or farmers at large, I mean there's a market there for the carbon coming back to what Jim was saying about those grants. I mean ultimately they're trying to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere and how you quantify that is an interesting and intriguing yeah. thing I would imagine needs to be learned. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one of the big things I try and get students excited about somewhat unsuccessfully is just measuring carbon going back into the ground because actually it's a real challenge to accurately measure soil carbon sequestration rates because you have to soil sample in so many different places and it's just different in different like within 100 yards of like so, so you kind of have to know your soil and know where to sample but it is so it is a growing thing is these monitoring and measurement tools and in California, farmers are eligible for Healthy Soils Grant funding, which is, I think, from cap and trade revenue originally, um, to implement these practices that are proven to sequester carbon on their farms. But it's an interesting challenge because they have to prove results after one year, which is often not the time frame in which the carbon is most effectively sequestered. And so there's all kinds of challenges with it that I think we need more education to improve how we do these things. And the other challenge is that the rates on an individual farm, depending on how small the farm is, can be really, really small. And so the numbers you get to on Project Drawdown are globally aggregated. So if you got like thousands of farmers to participate in your area, you might notice a pretty significant effect. But, um, or especially if they were smaller farmers. In California, you might need only like three big farms. But still, it's like getting to the scale of of promised global reductions is is like a definitely an educational piece and sort of a farmer workforce training piece, which I think is an interesting thing to think about. But yeah, training more people how we measure carbon storage is definitely a 21st century skill we should be talking about with students. And just to build on that, uh, you know, the the, the land grant uh, extension agents and educators uh, mm -hmm. part of their emerging space might be to do exactly what you just said because if you can quantify and thereby mm -hmm. monetize the carbon yeah. you might be able to I mean you were talking about that that inner making farms viable uh, for you know a business and yeah. if there's a way to get money from farming yep. carbon as well yeah. as farming produce and other you yeah. know then then you're, you're starting to get to a really rich and interesting place but I think yep. maybe that might be more at an undergraduate uh, you know, level, uh, you know, where you have young farmers of America kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's definitely a concept that can be introduced in middle school and high school. But yeah, something that would have to be dug into maybe a little later in, in undergraduate educa education, like how to actually do that and how to understand it and scale it up. Because, I mean, it is, it, like, there's proxies where you can measure water holding capacity increases and then assume an increase in soil carbon. But if you don't precisely measure and quantify it, you might not be able to monetize it. So that's the uh, the piece that we need to work on. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a really, really good place to go with this. Tell people to keep studying this in college. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Slaney, for your very interesting uh, presentation today. It's given me a lot to think about, and I think a number of the rest of us on the call today. We really Great. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all for your insightful comments and questions. I really appreciate presenting with you all and benefiting from this community. That's why we exist. As do we all. <laughs> thank you. Great. Take care, all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lenny. Take care. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.